scalar tensor theory, it has a parameter omega. And the general relativity limit is when this omega becomes large. If you make an expansion in powers of 1 over omega, the first correction is 1 divided by omega. Now, this has been tested in the solar system, as I said, to high precision. It's also tested using binary pulsars. The difference between the PPM parameter and 1 is less than 2 times 10 to the minus 5 within the solar system, owing to ranging of the Cassini spacecraft measurement of the Shapiro time delay, which you could think as being somewhat analogous in, to the integrated Sachs Wolf effect in cosmology. It's measuring the effect of gravitational potentials on the propagation of light, and in particular on the time it takes light to travel. This, incidentally, is a photograph of Saturn eclipsing the sun, as seen by the Cassini spacecraft. And it's one of my favorite, all-time favorites for the most beautiful astronomical photo I've ever seen. I encourage you to go to Astronomical Picture of the Day and download it, pick your own favorite, and uh, just ponder this beautiful picture. See if you can find the Earth. If you have seen uh, Al Gore's movie and are familiar with his An Inconvenient Truth and, and familiar with his uh, uh, kind of Carl Sagan's use of the term the pale blue dot, you can find it in this picture. It's really beautiful. I also like it because it illustrates a different kind of lensing, lensing here by the atmosphere of Saturn. Remarkably, a similar test can be applied on astronomical scales using strong gravitational lenses. These are results from a compilation of strong lenses found in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey and measured with the Advanced Camera for Surveys on the Hubble Space Telescope, the so-called SLAPS uh, lenses. This uh, work was done by uh, Schwab et al. and shows their posterior distributions Yes, they used the Bayesian methodology to estimate the posterior, the net posterior distribution from all these lenses for the parameter gamma ppn. And you see it peaks very sharply around 1, although for any individual measurement, there's quite a bit of scatter. Uh, as we will see, to make these measurements, what one has to do is to compare the deflection of light with some other measure of gravitation, namely a Newtonian gravitational potential. In the case of these lenses, that's done by modeling the uh, stellar dynamics, the velocity dispersions. And the ability to do that and correct for systematic errors limits the accuracy for any single lens. Nonetheless, this is a, a striking extension of the solar system tests of light deflection, deflection or effects on propagation of light to kiloparsec scales. It would be wonderful to see extensions of this to megaparsec scales, perhaps with strong lensing and clusters. There, what has even a greater challenge, I suspect, of modeling the dynamics of the clusters, uh, correcting for projection effects, and so on, as we heard in some of the uh, contributed talks. Now, is this approach uh, compatible with modified gravity? It's an obvious question is, if the tests of gravitation are so strong in the solar system, is there any room for modified gravity? Well, one can, of course, uh, appeal to theoretical ignorance and suppose that the solar system and the universe are two distinct spheres of thought. But that's not very satisfactory. One would like to have consistent gravitation theories that can extend from the solar system to the cosmic scales. And that turns out not to be entirely trivial. In particular, in these higher order uh, gravity theories, the absence of the, of the Birkhoff uh, theorem means that there can be a coupling between long scales and uh, short scales in such a way, for example, that the behavior of fields on large scales, the universe or even the galaxy, can in these theories have an effect on solar system gravitational fields. It seems bizarre from our intuition in general relativity but this is a generic feature of many of these modified gravity theories. It turns out this is a very beautiful uh, solution that evades this type of uh, problem, identified by Curry and Weltman a few years ago, called the chameleon mechanism. 
roughly speaking, these higher order theories, modified gravity theories, have an additional scalar field. I described it as a scalar odds for f of r theories, but you can make it an explicit field in the Einstein frame tree using those conformal transformations. And in these theories, it often happens that the mass of this extra field or degree of freedom is proportional to the curvature. That means in regions of high density and high curvature, because the Einstein equations are approximate, so high curvature means high density. Then the mass is large, constant wavelength is short, and in static solutions, that means that, that, the, that the field can be trapped inside uh, dense objects like stars and then uh, decay uh, very rapidly across to kind of a skin, skin depth uh, effect. And so outside of the star, for example, in the Einstein frame, where one might expect to have fifth forces, uh, they're negligible. <coughs> Justin Curry called this chameleon mechanism because this uh, scalar field uh, colors itself, chooses its clothing, depending on its environment, and it hides itself inside of high density regions. It's been shown by a number of authors, in particular Hu and Sawicki, that this mechanism and uh, relatives to it allow one to construct at least classically consistent f of r theories that range from solar system scales to cosmological scales. And as far as I understand, those theories, while they may not be very attractive as fundamental theories of physics, are completely viable at the, both the classical and the quantum level, insofar as we understand much about quantum gravity. Maybe someone here will uh, raise a question or uh, a point about this in the discussion, because I'm not an expert, and I'm always interested to learn more about these theories. Now, I want to come back to uh, my points in the second lecture, because they're going to, I'm going to apply these main ideas in these tests of gravitation on large scales. So recall from the second lecture that the alternative theories have these at least one additional uh, scalar field very typically, and they lead to an effective uh, variation of the Newton constant, which can depend on the environment, on the curvature, for example, because this that so far is a function of the curvature scalar, the reaching scalar. So that's one thing. This is in the, appears, for example, in the Poisson equation. So the right-hand side, the Newton constant, may have a coefficient that varies on time or location or generically on the density itself. So you have a nonlinear kind of Poisson equation. And then the other uh, generic departure from general relativity is the difference of these two <coughs> gravitational potentials one, the Newtonian potential, and the other I've called the curvature potential. It's what occurs in the spatial part of the weak field metric. And parameterized in another way, uh, this gravitational slip in the modified gravity theories just reflects a variation in the logarithm of 1 plus f sub r. This is where f of r theories, you can uh, write down expressions for any class of theories, and Generically, you have a function which depends on space and time here and here as well. Clearly, these will have consequences for structure formation, gravitational lensing, and likely background. So what about the first one? Uh, with growth of structure, that was in the Poisson equation. And what about the second? Gravitational lensing. Growth of structure, gravitational lensing, those are going to be the keys to testing uh, gravitation. So in the growth of, of structure, even in theories with fifth forces, provided that they couple universally, one can go to a frame in which there are no fifth forces by redefining fields, so-called Jordan frame. And in that frame, the non-relativistic motion of uh, particles obeys Newton's laws, universality of free fall, where Again, the Poisson equation would be modified, and instead of writing G Newton divided by 1 plus F sub R, I just put some effective Newtonian gravitation coupling here. Now, you can combine the continuity and Euler equations for uh, cold matter, 
to get this famous equation for the growth of the structure, it, it uses the Poisson equation, so it is, the growth of structure is sensitive to the variation of the Newton constant. And of course, it also depends on the source terms. Not just matter, but there may also be variations in dark energy or additional fields. This might even represent uh, an effective energy fluctuation of the scalar field. Okay. So in principle, one can have these sorts of uh, terms in the equations, and then you may well ask, how could you possibly distinguish and separate them? And the answer is not always very clear. But if you do have a model for these, for these functions for fluctuations in dark energy, or perhaps you neglect them, and you maybe have a model for the scale and time dependence of this uh, gravitation coupling, then it's straightforward to integrate this equation together with the other equations of uh, cosmology and make predictions for how modified gravity would affect transfer functions for the growth of structure, etc. This has been done nicely in a series of articles by uh, Shalala, who incorporated modified gravity in a parameterized form into the CAM code. But there is, of course, the second term with dark energy, and this equation alone cannot distinguish. Even if we have perfect measurements of the density fluctuations, we could correct our galaxy biasing and so on, we, we could not distinguish source of uh, variations on the right-hand side. So one needs more observables, and gravitational lensing helps, although it introduces its own theoretical functions to be determined. The deflection of, of light N is, in the weak field limit, a unit vector directed along a light ray. This is the component of the gradient that's perpendicular to N, so that this deflection does not change the magnitude of the unit uh, vector. And of course, it's known very famously that the deflection of light is different from the deflection of a massive body moving at the speed of light. I know that makes no sense, but if you take Newtonian gravity and uh, for, forget about special relativity, but just accelerate a particle up to the speed of light in Newtonian gravity, its deflection would not have this second term. The okay. uh, reason for that is in this uh, weak field metric, both the time and space parts of the metric are important for relativistic particles. And they both have these potential contributions, the Newtonian and the curvature of potential. And I am using the choice of uh, definitions of these such that it's the sum of the two potentials, which is the source for lensing. You have to be aware of the literature there are various uh, definitions about the signs. Now, the difference of these two potentials in the weak field limit is zero in general relativity, but it's not if you have modified gravity or if you have stressed dark energy. So how can we get access to this function and then ultimately we'll try to get the Newtonian potential from measurements of the motion of mass and calculate this gravitational slip? Well, weak gravitational lensing is an ideal method on large scales, although maybe not large enough because one would actually like to probe scales of hundreds of megaparsecs or more and uh, weak lensing is a, is a weak signal, and I don't know if it is uh, viable to make measurements on such large scales. How does this work? Well, this says that light rays get deflected. Of course, if I just take an image of a, a distant source in the sky and suppose that as the light rays travel to us, they've been deflected by mass, to a first approximation, that just shifts the entire image without changing its shape or structure. However, gradients of this, or tides, if you like, in the Newtonian sense, can distort or shear the image. Weak lensing surveys try to measure this shear statistically. And in effect, what they're doing is measuring some components of this magnification matrix. And those components, uh, in a limit of small deflections, involve second derivatives in the transverse direction, plane of the sky, of the sum of these two potentials, actually integrated along the line of sight. 
this is the lensing uh, potential. And the idea of lensing is to measure the distortion of the images from the sources and try to reconstruct some components of this tensor, the off-diagonal so-called shear components. One recent review is by Huxter and Chang. Let's back up and take a 30,000 foot view of what we're trying to do here. The key observables uh, from theorist's perspective, we would like to measure the expansion history. And you can either use Hubble's parameter or this conformal expansion rate. Uh, A is 1 over 1 plus redshift. So in principle, this can be measured, maybe not directly, but indirectly by uh, the integral of the expansion rate appearing in formulas for angular diameter distance, luminosity distance, and so on. So one would measure this by using uh, standard candles or other methods for distance estimation. I should point out that uh, this is really one of the easiest things, perhaps, to measure on this diagram, probably the easiest. And yet we don't know H of A, the expansion history, all that well. It's been a triumph of cosmology to measure H to a few percent in a local universe. But at a redshift of 1, do we know the expansion rate is better than 30 percent? Are we going to make precision cosmology tests then? That's a tough game. Of course, we can try to parameterize uh, deviations of H of A from the Lambda CDM model and put them into codes like CAM. I don't know if that's been done. It might be worthwhile to take advantage of the high precision of CMB measurements. But the direct measurements based on distance indicators are not terribly accurate. Going down the list, things become progressively more difficult. The matter fluctuations uh, can be measured, assuming that galaxies trace the mass, from redshift surveys directly by looking at the clustering of galaxies as a function of uh, distance and location. And, and also, of course, there is a major contribution of this clustering to weak lensing effects. Now, uh, of course, the actual fluctuation field is some random field. And this goes back to Alicia uh, Brady's first uh, lecture, where we don't try to predict a uh, priori where the Andromeda galaxy is located. But what we can do is construct power spectra and measure the so-called transfer functions, which tell us how, as a function of the magnitude of k, the wave number, and the expansion factor, these fluctuations grow with time. That's what we would like to do. We'd like to measure the transfer functions directly. That's what's done, by the way, in the, in the CMB, in effect, to construct the famous power spectrum plots, is fitting these transfer functions. Similarly, for peculiar velocities, if you think it's hard to measure the expansion history, it's even harder to measure deviations from uniform Hubble flow. But one way of doing it is looking at the so-called redshift space distortions, namely that if you look at the clustering uh, along the line of sight where redshift is used as a proxy for distance, and the clustering transverse to the line of sight, there will be some statistical differences because the radial distance is not distance. It's the Hubble velocity plus the peculiar velocity distance plus the peculiar velocity. Those redshift space distortions can be used to, in principle, again, to infer transfer functions for the divergence of the velocity or the velocity potential, another function that I introduced. And as we will see, that is a very powerful probe of the growth of structure, in principle. And then finally, of course, gravitational lensing could give us transfer functions for the sum of these two potentials. The integrated Sachs-Wolf effect involves the time derivative of those two potentials, but if you could measure this as a function of expansion factor and you know H, then they're equivalent. So the name of the game here is to do a kind of a tomography and measure in many redshift slices these transfer functions and the expansion rate. In principle, that can be done. I think this would be a, a big observational cosmology program for probably several decades. <laughs>
Now, we want to find the potentials and test whether they obey the predictions of general relativity or we need modified gravity. And here is where the universality of free fall and the motion of dark matter and atoms becomes a really powerful tool. If you take that Newton's law, dvdt is grab phi, Newtonian potential, and you write it in uh, expanding universe from moving coordinates with peculiar velocities, and you take its divergence, then you get an equation relating the Newtonian potential and the velocity potential. So if one could measure this transfer function for the peculiar velocities by redshift space distortions as a function of redshift, you directly measure this potential. All you're assuming is that the galaxies are moving in free fall. This does not assume general relativity is valid. This is true, for example, in any modified gravity theory in the Jordan frame, any theory that locally obeys special relativity without additional forces that would couple differently to galaxies uh, than to objects in the solar system. So having done that, one could then take the Laplacian of this and, and compare it, the transfer function, with that of the dark matter uh, fluctuations, the, the matter. That allows one to check the Poisson equation. And that's very good because, remember, the Poisson equation in principle has corrections from modified gravity or from fluctuating dark energy. And then if one can also measure the transfer functions for the sum of the two potentials from gravitational lensing, one can <coughs> compute the difference. And again, have another test of those for measurement of those factors involving dark energy or modified gravity. Now at this level, that may not be enough to completely distinguish dark energy or modified gravity, but in principle you have two functions, two scale factors, which you can then ask, is there a consistent framework of dark energy or of modified gravity which accommodate those behaviors? And that would be great progress indeed. So this is being done, and one way to, to think about it, again conceptually, Let's start out with the hypothesis that there is uh, no dark energy, or at least it doesn't cluster. I'm allowing for a cosmological constant because that can be part of modifying gravity theories. And then I have this uh, growth structure equation, and, and here, since I know people like to use proper time instead of conformal time, I'll just change the time variable, and perhaps it's a, a bit more familiar. So here from the Poisson equation, I have the effects of uh, modified gravity. And now I want to test whether this effective Newton constant is just a Newton constant uh, of the solar system, which is a constant as far as we know or not. So you would, on large scales, where uh, there's no additional k dependence in this equation, you would, you would measure the transfer functions or the growth rates, as I said, from galaxy clustering weak lensing, et cetera. And then you can look at the logarithmic derivative of this, of this function, which for g newton equals constant has a known solution. I gave a quadrature solution for it in my first lecture. If you know the background expansion, you can make an exact prediction for this function. Many people have done that. Or you can just treat this so-called beta, the logarithmic growth rate, as another function describing the growth history. And Eric Linder has parameterized this in terms of the matter uh, fraction, omega m, so function of redshift, and an exponent gamma, and shown that this uh, can be a very powerful test of general relativity. Okay, let's come to the weak uh, lensing and the lensing uh, potentials, where one would like to measure the gravitational slip. Again, under this Overall, overarching assumption that we're going to uh, assume there's no dark energy but test for modified gravity, then we would measure the weak lensing shear correlation function to get statistics of some of these two potentials. The most direct way to measure the Newtonian potential 
as I said, is actually to go to the computer velocities. Okay, because again, of universality of freefall. And by combining those, you can get a handle on gravitational slip. And this was pointed out in, a, in an elegant way by uh, John et al. Uh, several years ago, and then applied by Reyes et al. in an article in Nature uh, last year. They calculated this statistic, which comes from weak lensing and from Reyes' space distortions. There are a lot of technical issues here in exactly what ratio you, you pick you want to try and correct for effects of biased galaxy formation, for example, and other systematics, which they, they raised at all, uh, did they argue for, uh, for this measurement. And they made this measurement, as you can see, on several length scales, which are not quite 100 plus megaparsecs, but the weak lensing is at getting a signal uh, up here to distances of uh, 40 megaparsecs. And this ratio, it turns out, depends on a ratio of uh, omega matter to this uh, beta function. I am using uh, Eric's parameterization. That goes like omega matter to the power of 1 minus gamma. Gamma is roughly 0.6 in GR theory. And so for the measured value of uh, omega matter, about, uh, point, uh, about a quarter or so, E sub G would be predicted to be about uh, 0.4 in general relativity, but not so in some alternative uh, theories of gravity, for example, in the scalar uh, tensor vector theory of uh, Bekenstein, the value would be lower. And there is consistency with GR and then CDM, and also with uh, classes of f of r theories. Uh, just to uh, repeat, from the peculiar velocities, you have access to, in effect, to the growth of structure in, in densities. If you take this continuity equation, this is the divergence of the uh, velocity field, and just rewrite the density perturbation using the logarithmic derivatives, you involve this uh, beta function and the Hubble uh, parameter. I mentioned the integrated Sachs-Wolf effect. The temperature anisotropy, as uh, photons propagate to us after recombination, also before recombination, but interesting here is after recombination, where cosmic acceleration kicks in, involves the line of sight integral of the time derivative of the sum of these potentials. Again, any, anything to do with, with photons or relativistic particles involves the sum of the two potentials. And the effect is to modify the large angular scale CMB spectrum. A number of authors have pointed this out. This is from a paper of mine with Bill Zukin. And notice the effect of gravitational slip. When the gravitational slip is positive, when the curvature potential exceeds the Newtonian potential, basically you're, you're constraining the, the Newtonian potential by perturbations on uh, smaller scales, the dynamics of, of matter, that increases this sum. And it increases, therefore, the integrated Sachs-Wolf contribution to the CMB anisotropy at large angular scales. Conversely, when the slip is negative, the fluctuations are reduced. As was uh, remarked by previous speakers, this difference is within uh, statistical fluctuations of so-called cosmic variance. There's so few multiples on the sky that it's hard to have much statistical weight to a few uh, measurements. Of course, it is interesting that the CMB has uh, low water pole and octa pole with strained correlations among different components. I have no wisdom on that. I would not expect that as due to modify gravity, but it's fun to contemplate. What one can do, though, is to cross-correlate this uh, CMB anisotropy with galaxies, because galaxy <coughs> distribution, let's say a high redshift, is evolving in the very same gravitational potential that is producing the ISW effect. And so that removes the effects of cosmic variance. That measurement uh, has been 
used by a number of authors. Besides the Reyes et al. article, there have been several articles in the last year or so that have made tests combining a number of data sets. Uh, the expansion history from supernovae, typically one has to use weak lensing to uh, test uh, gravitation, CMB constraints, and I learned in this conference this wonderful notation of plus plus. These are important works. I'm not going to uh, have time to discuss them, but uh, Eric and some of the other authors are, are here, and there are some uh, posters related to some of this work that I, I will mention. This class of measurements is important, and in my view, ought to be a goal of future large-scale, large surveys and projects, and projects like uh, Euclid, uh, LSST, and W first if it is ever built and launched. There are some open issues in the uh, parameterization of these deviations from uh, general relativity. You know, um, general relativity is such a beautiful theory because, well, for many reasons, if you've studied it, you know that it's mathematically very elegant. It is extremely simple. It has uh, really no free parameters, aside from the value of the Newton constant, but that just sets a, a mass scale. How do you then construct alternative theories against which to compare? You should always do that when analyzing data, have, have a hypothesis and then have an alternative against which to compare. Well, there are different philosophies about this, and, and one way is to, is to use the the effects of the matter dynamics to concentrate on things that affect the observables. Okay. Growth of structure is affected by this variation of the, the Newton constant, and gravitational lensing departures uh, affect gravitational slip. There are a variety of parameter parameterizations for those. Uh, one that has been used pretty extensively in literature is inspired by the parameterized post-Newtonian framework in the solar system. That takes this curvature potential and calls it some constant gamma ppn times the Newtonian potential, and so it takes a ratio of these two potentials. Well, there are some advantages to taking ratios, as Zhang et al. and Reyes et al. showed. You can cancel some effects of biased galaxy formation that way. But there may also be a price to pay when you take ratios of data which have <coughs> noise then the ratios have different statistics. So for example, a ratio of two Gaussian fields is not Gaussian. Uh, that's well known. A difference is Gaussian. But of course, you then have to uh, deal with the systematic errors. So there are a lot of interesting issues here about what's the best way to parameterize and analyze the data, for which I have no particular expertise, but fortunately, others in the audience do. And so with that, let me point you to uh, some of the posters and talks. The use of uh, particular parameterized modified gravity theories for predicting and testing growth of structure and gravitational lensing appears in a nice poster by uh, Motohashi san And he, in particular, analyzed parameterized FFR models, which I recommend to you in the back. Alessandra Silvestri will give a talk tomorrow on her work with Michelle and other collaborators, Pogosian. And uh, another uh, student in that group, uh, Ali Rezi Hojati, has a poster. Their approach has been, in effect, to develop data compression techniques, which I like very well. Look at the power of the survey to, to try to ask, what in principle can I measure for the, for the scale and redshift dependence of uh, transfer functions? rather than relying on a specific parameterized model, which may be the wrong model, probably is, and therefore your estimates and constraints of its parameters may not be uh, so useful. And I apologize to any of my missed. I'm sure there are probably a number of other uh, posters and talks in this conference that deal with these data analysis issues. And I hope that uh, those of you who may have missed will raise your hand in the discussion period. So let me wrap up by reminding you uh, that I began my series of lectures with goals of observational cosmology, 
One of them was to determine the uh, density, mean density of the universe through the Friedman equation and the Hubble expansion parameter. I hope that in this series of lectures I've shown you that that's perhaps not the quite, quite the correct way of thinking about things if you want to test uh, general relativity. The number three goal of observational cosmology is to test general relativity theory on large scales, and we are making significant progress in this effort. There are now good tests of the gamma PPN parameter on kiloparsec scales, and tests through weak lensing and computer velocities on, on tens of megaparsec scales. So I look forward to further uh, progress in this in the coming years. You'll notice I inverted the order of number one and number two. I think I do want to have some discussion about what is the number one or the number two uh, goal of observational cosmology, but I want to end with my goal, which I hope also is yours for this conference, is to learn and enjoy sharing learning with each other, which we're able to do here this week thanks to the wonderful hospitality of our conference organizers, and I would like to thank them for this opportunity to speak with you and to thank you all for your attention. Question? inspired by the uh, PPN formalism in the solar system, and I decided to stop calling it gamma because gamma is used for so many other things in cosmology, in particular uh, Linder's growth exponent. But this gamma, here we call it PPN, is the ratio of the two potentials. And the gravitational slip is the difference of that. So the slip is equal to the Newtonian potential times gamma PPN minus 1. Remember the Cassini spacecraft limits on gamma minus 1 on solar system scales are it's less than 2 times 10 to minus 5. So that is directly saying that the gravitational slip is extremely small in the solar system. Potential itself is already of order uh, 10 to the minus 8 or so in the solar system. So, very good question. Thank you. I mean, the, the precision of measurements, that, as you mentioned, uh, kiloparsec scales and kiloparsec scales is much lower. So, you're saying that those, those um, parameters and maybe the exponents of those parameters are scale dependent. Oh, absolutely. Uh, my, well, conceptually, I don't want to speak here in details about the data analysis, implications for data analysis, because as I say, one has to think through carefully the systematic errors of uh, any uh, procedure. But, Theoretically, one would like to measure this uh, slip directly as a function, this transfer function as a function of scale and regimen. Of course, you then want to compare it with something else, which would be, let's say, the Newtonian potential. Uh, but remember, our access to the Newtonian potential often comes through the growth of density fluctuations, which itself involves the Newton constant. And a very important takeaway message here is that the Newton constant 
in modified gravity theories is not necessarily a constant. So you want to find a way of measuring that too. And uh, for that, you, you have to look at the density fluctuations um, compared with the velocity field. You want to try to directly evaluate the, uh, the uh, plus one equation. Are there other questions or comments? I would like some advice as to your number one or number two goal for observational cosmology. Observables to, to Terrific. So fundamental questions. So trying to understand the 